Well, welcome to Tea Time Spiritual Conversations for, with, and about women. I'm your host, Twana Henderson, and we have another exciting podcast for you on today. I am so excited about today's guest. Um, Our guest is Dr. Christopher Yuan. He is a speaker, author, Bible professor, and bearer of Christ. I love that. Uh, Dr. Yuan has an incredible ministry in which he speaks on faith and sexuality. Dr. Yuan, welcome to Tea Time. Thanks for having me on, Twana. I want to jump right in because there is so much that I want to get to. Mm -hmm. Um, You and your family have an amazing story about the redemptive power of Christ. Um, For those who are unfamiliar with your personal story, can you just give us a brief overview um, of how you came to faith in Christ? Uh, Because I know it wasn't a typical path uh, to becoming (laughs) a Bible professor. Yeah, I'd love to. So I was not raised in a Christian home, Twana, and and yet I wrestled with my sexuality. My parents raised me very traditional family values. Uh, my parents are were born in China, raised in Taiwan, came to the U.S. for graduate school. But I wrestled with my sexuality, and I didn't tell anyone. I was exposed to pornography from a young age and um, came out of the closet in my uh, 20s. Mm-hmm. I was, I'm from Chicago. And I moved to Louisville, Kentucky to pursue my doctorate in dentistry. I'm, my father's a dentist. And I came out of the closet then. Okay. After a year, I decided to go home, break the news to my parents. I told them I am gay. Wow. Devastated my parents. And remember, my mom's not a Christian. Yeah. So being your typical Chinese mother, you know, we call it, I don't know if you've heard this before, but uh, we call so often uh, times we call Chinese mothers tiger moms. Have you heard that before? I, well, I have, but I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> yeah, tiger moms meant uh, just mothers who are very protective over their children, want their best for the children, all great things, uh, but oftentimes then uh, go to the end of the world. I mean, do everything, and again, these are great things. Yeah, uh, but want their children to be. Very, very successful, very driven, uh, best in sports, best in education, best in everything, go to the best schools, all of that. So that's kind of your typical tiger mom. I mean, all these things. I mean, these aren't bad things. Right. Yeah. But, you and know, that's a lot of moms. <laughs> it's a lot of moms. You yeah. know, oftentimes uh, one of my best friends is Rosario Butterfield. And, and she says, oftentimes the enemy distracts us with good things from doing the best thing. Yeah. These are absolutely. all good things, but what's yes. the best thing? So anyway, I digress. So my mom, being a tiger mom, wanted to control the situation, mm-hmm. and she gave me an ultimatum. Choose the family or choose that. She couldn't even say it. Wow. And in her mind, her context, being a Chinese mother, she came to the U.S. for everything for who? Not for herself, but for, for her family, for her children. Mm-hmm. So they could, children could have a better life. So for her, I would obviously choose the family, right? I mean, that's that's Chinese, you know, Asians were, you know, there's so much unlike kind of the Americans, you know, kind of be independent, you know, be, you know, your you know, independent freedom in our but, almost but the culture outside important. the Western culture, whether, you know, it's South America, whether it's Africa, whether it's Asia, it's about family, community. Yeah. And so yeah. I thought, well, you know, my mom thought, of course, I was going to choose this. Well, I kind of bought into the American dream, quote unquote. I bought into this lie that it's all about me. And I thought, well, if you can't accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. So I left home. Mm-hmm. Devastated my mom. Yeah. Yeah. What's worse is my parents' marriage was a wreck. Oh, my goodness. After years of living as non-Christians, after years of unresolved issues, my parents' marriage was a disaster. They actually began the paperwork for a divorce. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so my mom was at the end of a rope. Remember, I mean, again, I have to put in the context of, of Chinese culture. Yeah. Family is everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes, I mean, I think many mothers, they, they see that. Yeah. They can understand that. But especially added on that was the Chinese culture. Family is everything. You always put yourself under the family. And so when my mother saw the family falling apart, my brother was also kind of doing his own thing. So my, it was my dad that you're about to get a divorce. And then me, you know, in, in my mother's mind, I'd rejected her. My brother was doing his own thing. So my mom was like, I have no value. I'm nothing. Wow. So my mom decided to do the unthinkable. And she was going to end her life. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Amazingly, God kind of put on her heart. Remember, she's not a Christian. Go see this minister uh-huh. who gave her a little pamphlet on homosexuality. Wow. And 
with only her purse and that little pamphlet she didn't pack, she boarded on the train a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville where she planned to say goodbye to me for the last time wow. before ending it all. Oh, my goodness. So on the train, she decided to read this little pamphlet, this mm -hmm. little booklet, which shared with her the gospel that all of us are sinners. And yet in spite of our sin, the God of the universe still loves us. Absolutely. And now, on this train. Yeah, go ahead. Now, let me ask you. Now, I know in your first book, um, Out of a Far Country, um, which you actually co-author with your mother, Angela. Yes. Um, you you came out to your mom. Both of you are not believers in Christ. Right. Um, you know, her initial response was the rejection. Um, and it wasn't until she really became yes. a Christian and realized that she was a sinner, that she was able to to love you as God loves all of us sinners. Exactly. T tell us more about that. Yeah. You know, what's so amazing, Tawana, you know, we hear the the narrative today, whether on the news, whether on, from Hollywood, I mean, the, the movies, uh, what was the most recent movie, uh, Boy Erased, you mm -hmm. know, with the three stars were either Oscar winners or Oscar nominated. Mm -hmm. So that's a big time movie. And this whole movie was about this message that if you are a devout, evangelical, Bible-believing Christian, you cannot love your gay child. You have to actually shed off that conservative Bible teaching as the mother in the story ended up doing in mm -hmm. Boy Erased, she left her faith. The father remained. So the father couldn't love the son, according to this story. But the mother could because she basically became not a Christian or changed her, changed the Bible. <laughs> and so that's the story, that you, you cannot love your gay child as a Bible-believing conservative Christian. You have to actually shed that to love your gay child. Well, I had the exact opposite experience. My parents were not Christian. They rejected me. It was only until they became followers of Christ, not people who just go to church, mm -hmm. not people who just say I'm a Christian only on Sundays and there's no evidence in their life for the rest of the week until yeah. they became followers of Jesus Christ, that they knew that they could do nothing other than to love their gay child. We don't reject our sinful children. Mm -hmm. We love them. Yeah as God loved them. And you know how God loved them and God loves us? Romans yeah. chapter five. Yeah. While we were weak, while we were powerless, while we were still sinners, that word still is so important. Mm -hmm. And while we were his enemies. Yeah. So yeah. so my parents did that and uh, they were, tried to reach out to me. I was in Louisville and just my, you know, so my mom became a Christian. I thought she had lost her mind. <laughs> um, she, uh, I kept doing what I, you know, it, while I was in Louisville, I started partying like my friends. I started going to the clubs, started experimenting with drugs, started selling drugs and not all gays and lesbians do drugs. There's a kind of myth that, oh, you're gay and you do drugs. No, that's not true. Some do, some do not. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately that is part of my story. I'm not telling everyone's story. I'm just telling my story. And yeah. I have to be honest about that. Yes. But, um, I was started selling drugs, doing drugs. Eventually I was expelled from dental school. Oh my goodness. So then I moved to, and, and this is also important. I was expelled. My parents flew from Chicago to Louisville. In, in my mind, I thought they were going to fight for me, fight against the school that for them to keep me in school. And you know what my mother did? She prayed and fasted about this. She told the school, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. Wow. See, a lot of times parents, especially mothers, they want to protect their children. I mean, that seems right. We want to protect our children. But what we end up doing is we're protecting them from God. Yeah. So yeah. we get in God's way from God trying to work. And we actually remove the very consequences that actually could bring our children to their knees, down to... Uh, you know, eating with the pigs, eating the pods of the pigs, as the parable, you know, the prodigal son talks yeah. about. And yeah. we're we trying to protect them from that. But what if God is wants to use that or will use that trial, that consequence to break them? Yeah. So my mom recognized that and said, I'm not going to protect 
uh, my son. And she said, you know, and she was actually thinking this was going to be rock bottom. Unfortunately, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, because you you continue to kind of spiral out of control. Horrible. I mean, you yes. you ended up in prison yes, for, Atlanta, for drug Georgia. dealing. Yeah, so I was in Atlanta and I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which was sell drugs. I became a supplier. My parents came to visit me. I kicked them out. They weren't preaching at me. They were just they were just being Jesus. And I kicked them out. My dad gave me his Bible there and I threw it in the trash. Then finally, like you say, I mean, my mom fasted and prayed. She she prayed, a, began praying a bold prayer, do whatever it takes, God. Mm-hmm. That's a bold prayer for a mother to make. Yeah. She was desperate. She fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf for a miracle. Oh my and that goodness. miracle came with a bang on my door. It was the federal drug enforcement <laughs> agents and Atlanta police. They came and confiscated all my money, all my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. Oh, my goodness. Now, let me just say, let me just let me interject this for my listeners, because and and I don't don't want to be, um, you know, stereotypical. You don't look like a drug dealer. (laughs) (laughs) So I need to say that they can't see you. But I want to say he does not look like a drug dealer at all. I had to put that in there. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, that was, I think, maybe one reason why I got away with it for so long. You know, And, and, and the funny thing is, even in prison. I had my inmate friends that were telling me, but wait, you didn't have to do drugs. You didn't have to sell drugs. You had it made. And I'm like, you know what? Sin does not come to find you. And also, I I wanted to tell my friends, you also had a choice. We all have a choice between life Mm -hmm. and death, between following God and not. I mean, unfortunately, we have respectable sins, don't we? You know, the Absolutely. whole world. But unfortunately, God, uh, or I mean, the enemy used this, what I look like, to get away from it for so long. But you can't run from God. Yeah. You can't run from God. And, uh, you know, so I was finally in jail. And, and the funny thing is we fool ourselves into thinking I'll never get caught. I was in jail. And um, I... Uh, called all my friends thinking, you know, well, these are friends that say, whenever you need something, give me a call. So I thought, (laughs) well, I'll call them. No one answered my phone call. And what I didn't realize was years before that, my mom knew that as long as I had those type of friends around, you know, those type of friends, oh, you know, you know, just that kept me more into trouble than anything else. Yeah. My mom specifically prayed that God would do whatever it takes uh, that, uh, you know, that those friends would desert me. Yeah. And they deserted me. That one answer, friend answered my collect call. So I wow. called home, dreading making that phone call, just thinking the earful that I was going to get. My mother's first words, are you okay? Wow. No condemnation, just words of unconditional love and grace. Yeah. A couple of days after that, I was walking around that cell block, found a Bible in the trash can. In the trash can? <laughs> yes. It was a new, Gideon's New Testament. Took it back to my cell, began reading it. And at first it wasn't good news. I'm like, this isn't good news. Because I'm like, this is condemning me of my sin. Mm-hmm. But I kept reading. I kept reading. And, uh, you know, I, things got worse. I was called to the nurse's office. And the nurse told me that I'm HIV positive. Oh, my goodness. A few days after that, I was laying in my cell block all by myself. There was no one else in, in my cell at that time. And I looked up at the metal bunk above me and someone had scribbled. If you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper Prosper you you. and not to you. Plans to give you hope and and a future. future. I mean, any verse could have been on there. But God uses that specific verse. I mean, in original context, how God is going to call them out of exile. Well, I was in exile in prison. And God was telling Israel that I'm going to call you out of Israel, even though they were rebellious. And I was rebellious. And I knew if God can have a plan... Or a rebellious Israel, he could have plans, had a plan for me. I don't know what that meant, but I knew that God was going to continue to call me. And so I began reading the Bible, and that was when I realized, you know, that God was not calling me out of homosexuality. He was first calling me, first and foremost, to himself. That mm-hmm. God was not, and I had put my identity in the wrong thing, that I'd put my identity in being gay when I knew I needed to put my identity in Christ. So and that was kind of the bulk of my new book on holy sexuality and the gospel. But anyway, God called me. At, this whole thing God was teaching me, in, in, and he called me to ministry. I went to Moody right out of, out of prison, 
and uh, then went on to my master's and doctorate. So let me let's back up for a minute, because that's yeah. a lot, because in terms of God calling you uh, in terms of your identity, talk about that, because it's so important to begin with identity, which is who we are. And, and like you said in your book, um, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, um, you identify with an important theological term, uh, theological anthropology. That's a big yes, word. Big um, word. <laughs> um, can you unpack that for uh, us and, and talk about what that means and why the whole idea of identity is so important? Yes, we cannot understand human sexuality unless we begin with theological anthropology. That sounds like a really... Uh, hard to understand phrase, sentence, but actually it isn't. Human sexuality, we all understand that. And if it's human sexuality, not animal sexuality, not, you know, whatever, cow sexuality, you know, we're talking about human sexuality. So to understand sexuality, human sexuality, we need to understand humans. Well, humans through what lens? Through God's God's lens, through the word of God. Mm -hmm. So theological anthropology, anthropology is a study of humanity. Mm -hmm. Theological anthropology is study of humanity through God's eyes. So that's basically what that means. And what does theological, if, how can I distill theological anthropology, you know, maybe in just two, two main points? Two main points would be, first, every human being is created in the image of God. We call that the imago dei. That's mm -hmm. Latin for image of God. Second, that we can't just end there. Sometimes people just they only, you know, fixate on that and nothing else. There's that other very important concept, which comes from Genesis 3, which is the fall. Every human being has been impacted by or are living because of the consequences of the fall. Paul talks about it many times in his epistles by using the word flesh. Sometimes it's translated as sinful nature. Mm -hmm. So understanding sexuality in light of being created in the image of God and with the fact that we all have a sin nature is very important. So when we talk about what is my identity, well, my identity is I'm created in God's image. And if I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. But unfortunately, we all are wrestling with the consequences of the fall. We are wrestling. We are fighting against our sin nature. That really is the framework. We need to start there and then build on that. And then when it comes to identity, the why this is so important with sexuality is because I don't know of any other behavior or been any other desire that we have turned into personhood. For example, when you ask someone who identifies as gay, what do you mean by that? You know, not to be you know, to be feisty with them or to be mm -hmm. argumentative. Just just say, I know what that means, but I want to hear your words. I want to hear what you explain. Tuana, you will not hear them say, when I say I'm gay, I mean, this is what I feel. Mm -hmm. When I say I'm lesbian, I mean, this is what I do. You won't hear that. You know what they hear? What we will hear today? They will say, when I say I'm gay, I mean, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. This shift from what to who has created a radically distorted view of personhood. And unfortunately, even Christians fall into that trap. We call ourselves, I'm a straight Christian. I'm a gay Christian. No. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm created in God's image, but I'm also a sinner. And so that helps us to frame that as opposed to making our experience who we are. Sexuality is not who we are. It's how we are. Yeah. So can you explain then that, that term, holy sexuality? What, what does yeah. that mean? Well, I know it's a new phrase, uh, but I'm juxtaposing that against the framework, the secular framework of heterosexuality, bisexuality, and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I think we pigeonholed ourselves into that secular framework, that secular mold, because we think, well, that's the only, you know, you know, uh, paradigm that we know of. So if homosexuality is not right, then heterosexuality must be. Well, if I realize and kind of align that with God's word, yes, Sexual relationships is reserved for marriage between man and woman, and that is a form of heterosexuality, but not representative of all. So actually, the phrase holy sexuality came with my frustration in saying, well, yes, homosexuality is not God's will, but can I say that heterosexuality in all its various forms, including adultery, including sex before marriage, including, let's even say incest, include that, that uh, you know, incest between maybe a father and his daughter, that that's, mm. you know, right? That's, those are heterosexual. 
but it's not precise enough. So holy sexuality came from my our need to be precise. God's word is always precise. Twana, if you look at my cover of my book, it's what? Black and white. Mm-hmm. That was actually very intentional. You know why? Because we're living in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. Yeah. <laughs> God's truth is black and white. There's no gray. And especially yeah. when it comes to sexuality. So what is holy sexuality? Holy sexuality is this. It's quite simply two paths, either chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And marriage is, as Jesus defines it in Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 19, between one man and one woman. So holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, or because we all start out that way, Mm -hmm. or faithfulness in marriage. And actually, we all then end up as single, as Jesus says in Matthew 22, that no one will be married in heaven. But that's because we corporately will be wed to the Lamb of God. Yeah. So you talk about God's grand story. Mm -hmm. How does that shape our understanding of sexuality? Yeah. So the reason why I wrote Holy Sexuality was I did, first of all, no author wants to just add another book of something that's already been said. There's been Mm -hmm. a lot of good books going over the different biblical passages that touch on uh, homosexuality and the prohibition against homosexual behavior and desires. Mm -hmm. But what I found was that there was no overarching book addressing it theologically. So it wasn't until while I was at in Bible college that I recognized the difference between biblical studies and theological studies. Biblical studies looks at specific passages, uh, look at verses, look at books, whereas theology looks at one particular topic or theme and see how the whole of Scripture communicates about that. So that's different. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have any books talking about a theology of sexuality, and that was my desire to do that. So God's grand story is basically that, looking at the broad scope of God's grand story, which we can say in four four, uh, simple things, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, meaning in the last days. So how does that help us to better understand? And that's, it it tells us a lot, because when we think about our sin, we can't just think about it in light of that. We have to, you know, or just isolated. We have to look at it at, in light of how we're created in the image of God, but then we fell, but then we have to talk about the hope that we have. But then what does that mean as we are redeemed on this side of glory? That means that we will still struggle. Everyone will struggle. So for example, people ask, do I still have same such attractions? Well, I kind of then reframe that question in light of God's grand story in that what does it mean to live as a redeemed Christian? Mm-hmm. Do redeemed Christians uh, are are redeemed Christians still tempted? Well, when we read through the Bible, we we see that Jesus Christ was tempted for forty days. The Book of Hebrews writes says that Jesus Christ was tempted in every way, but he was without sin. And Paul, several times in the in his epistles in Galatians and in Romans, talks about that. You know, I do what I don't want to do, so we will still be tempted on this side of glory. Uh, So, I mean, it's no surprise that I'm still tempted by sinful uh, temptations, but I'm called to resist them or to mortify them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thinking in light of that helps us to understand. And then also with the the last part of God's grand story, which is, you know, the last day consummation. And when we understand, for example, uh, our ultimate goal, how because there will be no marriage in heaven, which I mentioned earlier, Matthew mm-hmm. 22. If there's no marriage in heaven, you know what that also means? So if we follow the logic that actually there will be no sex in heaven, mm-hmm. which it doesn't, that, that shouldn't be, oh, <laughs> that we're so sad. I mean, there's going to be something even greater, I mean, you know, than anything that this world has to offer. So there will be no sex in heaven because there's no more need to procreate in heaven, which then also means there will be no sexual desires in heaven because we can't have any unfulfilled desires. And if we follow that logic, that also means that there will be no sexuality in heaven. Sexuality will be fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. So sexuality, I mean, all this emphasis that we're putting on the here and now on our sexuality is not something of uh, our, you know, in in the consummated age. That that is not something. So having us help us, you know, God's grand story frame this whole conversation and many other things. And those are just a few examples that I gave can really give us a broader understanding of sexuality. 
You've just been listening to part one of my interview with Christopher Yuan. Be sure to tune in for part two and the conclusion of this exciting interview.